up a few minutes and just praise him in your own way then. Praise him like you want to. Don't worry about the person next to you. Just do your thing. another minute or two. Lookers and waiters can yeah, go out in the hallway in the lobby or something. Clap your hands and give him glory. How many love the Lord this morning? Amen. Now listen, some, somebody, one of y'all, y'all got to get on y'all's job. Somebody's not on their job. You can't be expected of me to do everything because one of y'all need to bind up this snow and stuff. And this, <laughs> now, when my intercessor, somebody better get, get I'm, why should we be looking for my wife to do everything? Somebody got to burn. I'm getting tired of waking up, looking out that window and being like, oh, here we go again. Now, it's April now, so one of y'all better utilize the authority you have in Christ. <laughs> Take authority over his weather. Go outside in the front yard, stretch your hands, or do something. <laughs> you need to do like Elijah did. It will not snow again for nine months unless I say so. <laughs> so I'm getting about tired of this. You know what this that this stuff make you want to go back to bed. You get up, you go up to the window, and, oh man, I'm going back to bed. Wake me when it's over. So I deputize somebody, whoever feels feels their calling. And that way we gonna blame it on you. <laughs> Y'all love the Lord. Let's go in the book of Romans, the seventh chapter. I have a word that I believe can be a blessing for you if you have an ear to hear and a heart to receive this morning. Those of you watching online, get your Bible out too. Or your cell phone or your iPad or your computer or whatever. Amen. We're going to begin reading in this 14th verse of the seventh chapter of the book of Romans down through the Sixth verse of the eighth chapter. When you're there, say amen. amen. Let's read. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold unto sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inner man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members, O wretched man that I am. 
who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I'm going to read one final passage of scripture, 24th verse of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Let's pray. Father, in the outstanding, tremendous, magnificent name of Jesus, whose we are and whom we serve. We thank you once again for the opportunity and the privilege of gathering together to worship you in spirit and truth and in the liberty that our great country provides. Now, Lord, we incline our ears to hear and our hearts to receive that which you will present to us on this morning. We bind the devil in every way, form, or fashion that might seek to prevent us from receiving what thus saith the Lord. Every hindering, restless, distractive, inattentive spirit, we take authority over it, dismiss it from our presence. Now have your way, Holy Ghost. Move as you see fit all of you and none of us on this morning. And we give you praise in Jesus' name, thanking you in advance for what we expect to receive through this word. Let the church say amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The book of Romans, or more precisely, the epistle, the letter written to the church in Rome was written by the Apostle Paul. Evidence suggests that he wrote it from the city of Corinth. And it has to be noted, it's worth noting, saints, that there is no account in the Word of God of the founding, or really outside of the Word of God as well, there's no historical or biblical account of the founding of the church at Rome. There's no record of who founded it, who uh, implemented it, uh, who, who, who was used by God to, 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 to start that great, magnificent work. However, the church of Rome was already, or the church at Rome, the Christian church in Rome was already in existence before the apostle Paul ever went there. And if you read in the book of Acts, the second chapter, the 10th verse, you know, the one thing about the Bible is the fact that it's self-interpreting, uh, self-interpreting, not interpreting, self-interpreting. Uh, uh, you know, you get a line upon line, a precept upon precept, as the Bible says, here a little, there a little. You get it all, you gather it all together, and you, you, you rely on scriptural evidence to come to a conclusion. The, the second chapter of the book of Acts, the 10th verse, you'll discover that among those that were gathered on the day of Pentecost, it mentions the fact that there were there travelers from Rome. And uh, we can arrive at the conclusion that they no doubt went back to Rome. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, the events of that day and after, as a result of their going back after having partook of that Pentecostal outpouring, that Pentecostal effusion of power that was released on that day of Pentecost, that the, the, those that were from Rome were impacted by it, and they went back to Rome. They went back home, and the church was founded there. They went back and started a church. Now, at the time of the writing of this letter to the church in Rome, Paul the apostle had not yet been able to go there. Amen. He sensed the Lord leading him to go there. Amen. He desired to go there, and he ultimately did go there. Though he did not go there the way that he, amen, uh, desired to go there. Amen. Uh, because how many of you know oftentimes God will take you where you want to go, but he won't take you the way you wanted to go there. <laughs> He'll take you where you want to go, but you'll have to go through something to get there. 
uh, the, the Israelites wanted to go into the promised land, but they had to go through the wilderness to get there. Oftentimes, where you want to go, amen. Uh, uh, Joseph had to go through the pit to get to the palace, amen. Uh, uh, God will take you where you want to go, and he will take you where he's leading you to go, and he'll take you where he showed you you were to go, but oftentimes he won't show you that what it's going to take for you to get there. Say amen. Uh, and so Paul, you know, when he wrote this letter to the church at Rome, he did so out of the necessity of stating clearly to them the fundamentals of salvation that he and others were preaching and proclaiming in the name of Jesus. Amen. They, 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 they had to know, well, I mean, we, we know Jesus, but we need some fundamentals, amen. We need some fundamental truths that we need to proclaim, amen. And, and it, it, he summarizes world conditions. When you look at the, 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 the outlay of the book of Rome, he proceeds forward. And he goes up to the third chapter, the 23rd verse, and he summarizes the conditions of the world at that time by saying, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned, all have a sin nature and come short of the glory of God. That sin nature being the root cause of the sins that are committed by those in the world. Amen. And so he, he started in his letter discouraging, uh, amen, or discoursing regarding the Gentile world. He talked about the Gentiles first, and then he proceeded to talk about the Jewish nation after that. And then he summarizes, and he brings them all under the same judgment, amen, the, the same determination that all have sinned. He talked about the Gentiles, talked about the Jews, and he said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He looked at the Gentiles and he highlighted their unrighteousness. The Gentiles are, are doing a number of things that are displeasing to God. But then he looked at the Jews who were condemning the Gentiles. And he said, you're practicing the same things that you're condemning them for practice. Come on, talk to me. How many of y'all know about some folks like that? You're talking about them and you're doing it. You're condemning them for being the way they are, but you're being like that too. <laughs> and then he articulates after that the salvation that is provided and available for them all. Amen. That's consisting of three, amen, phases. He talked about sanctification, justification, and glorification. Sanctification being simply a change of service. Amen. From Satan to God. While justification is a change of state from sin to holiness. While glorification refers to the time when the body itself shall be changed, which will be accomplished at the first resurrection, which coincides with the rapture of the church. You know, for all those no rapture people that don't believe there's going to be a rapture, if you don't believe in the rapture, you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Because it says the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then when we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the air. That's the rapture. The rapture occurs at the first resurrection. So you can't say you don't believe in the rapture, but you believe in the resurrection because they're two, two sides of the same coin. Say amen to me. Uh, now, Paul had several reasons for writing this letter to the church at Rome. Primary among them was the fact that Paul knew the strategic importance of the city of Rome, amen, for the spread of the gospel worldwide. Rome had built these great highways and byways, amen, to, to serve as links or connectors to their empire, amen. And he knew that, that, that the city of Rome was very strategically important important to the spread of the gospel, being the capital of the civilized world at that time. And the church there, he knew, had to be rooted and grounded in the faith as it would be the base of evangelism. The word would go forth from there. And it had to be the place of evangelism. And so they had to be rooted and grounded in the faith because they would disseminate their faith all over Europe. Amen. And he also knew that Rome would ultimately be a place of persecution. Amen. The martyrs in Rome suffered like no other martyr suffered. Amen. And those martyrs had to be rooted and grounded in the faith. Those Roman Christians had to be rooted and grounded in the faith to be able to stand up in the face of the persecution, fully persuaded in, in the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. Talk back to me. Uh, so he had to articulate the fundaments of the faith to them. Now, in this presentation, amen, of said fundamentals, Paul, amen, had to address the human element 
that endeavored to put into practice the precepts that he presented. Amen. He had to address the human imperfection that accompanied the attempt to practice God's divine perfection. Amen. And so he states in the 14th verse of the 7th chapter of the book of Romans that he is carnal. Carnal. Soul under sin. And this word carnal as employed by Paul in this particular instance is not used to describe an unsaved person. It's not used to describe an unbeliever, amen. It's used to describe a Christian. It's used to describe a believer who, although they are saved, still find themselves in bondage to the power of their flesh. <laughs> Y'all help me, I'm going to get there, I promise, amen. Uh, he, he wrote this, and in using that word, Carl, he was addressing those that found themselves struggling with things that a quote-unquote Christian should not be struggling with. Talk to me somebody. Uh, because for some strange reason, saints of the Most High God, uh, a number of us or uh, we were uh, laboring under the mistaken notion that once we surrendered our lives to the Lord, uh, that the struggle was over. While the truth of the matter is that once we surrender our lives to the Lord, that's when the real struggle actually begins. Because we now find ourselves struggling with ourselves in ways that we did not have to struggle with ourselves before. If I'm talking to you, talk back to me. And we also find ourselves struggling with things that we did not have to struggle with before. We find ourselves now having to accept what we used to reject, while at the same time we reject what we used to accept. And not only did we used to accept it, we used to enjoy it. And you know, you have those that say, well, you know, when I got saved, God took the taste out of my mouth. But how many of you know that when you got saved, God left the taste in your mouth? And you had to crucify your own flesh with the affections and the lust, with the desires thereof, amen, that he left the taste there to give you something that you had to battle against, to give you something that you had to fight against. In the passages of scripture that we read, Paul is bearing his soul. He's, he's really opening himself up because people were holding him up as a paradigm of Christian perfection. And he wanted to let them know that, no, contrary to popular opinion, I got some stuff I'm dealing with too, amen. And he was not ashamed to let it out. He was not trying to walk in some kind of fake pseudo, pseudo Christianity that caused him to be above any of the things that the other believers were going through, amen. He bears his soul. He opens himself up like no other writer in the word of God does. And he relates to us his very personal experience, which is the very essence of the human situation, uh, an experience that most of us as believers have undergone ourselves. With truth be told, a great number of you are going through this same struggle right now, and that struggle is this. Uh, Paul said it. He told on himself. Uh, Paul knew what was right. Paul wanted to do what was right. But yet, somehow, he could not consistently do it. Paul knew what was wrong, and the last thing he wanted to do was what was wrong. But somehow, he just kept on doing it. <laughs> Am I in anybody's house this morning? Paul felt himself to be a split personality. He felt himself to be somewhat schizophrenic, came in, in his constitution and makeup. He said, I'm an unstable, double-minded man. He felt as if two people shared the same body. Felt himself being pulled in two different directions. Felt in himself an ongoing civil war. And he was haunted by these feelings of frustration, the ability to see and the ability to know what was good and what was pleasing to God and then his own inability uh, to 
do what he knew was good and pleasing to God. He was frustrated by his inability, amen, uh, to refrain from doing what was wrong even while he had the ability to recognize what was right. Am I talking to anybody today? If I'm talking to you, just, just, just blink your eyes at me because you don't need to tell on yourself this morning. Why is it that people hate their sin and love their sin at the same time? One Roman poet, Ovid. Ovid is the one who Paul quoted when he said, it's in him I live and move and have my being. He said, I see the right thing and I approve of it, but I follow after the wrong thing that I disapprove of. Now, watch this. The paradox finds its culmination in the fact that Paul is writing here not from a secular perspective. He's writing here from a spiritual perspective. He's not writing from a carnal perspective. He's writing from the Christian perspective. He's writing from the standpoint of one who had the born again experience. As one who had been baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. He's writing as one who is in possession of the indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost. He was writing as one who was a possessor of multiple spiritual gifts. Paul, who had received revelations from God and had been used mightily by God. He's writing as one who had been caught up into the third heavens itself and saw things that were that were unlawful for a man to utter. Writing as one who, while he was on the backside of the desert, had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ himself. Oh, he had all of this going on, all of these spiritual experiences, amen, that he was in possession of, but he was also writing as one who recognized the fact that despite the power of God in his life and despite the hand of God upon his life, the fact, despite the fact that he had walked with God and despite the fact that he talked with God, the greatest battle that he was engaged in, one in which his miracle working power and his spiritual exercises proved to be non effective against, one that the power of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit seemed to be non effective with, with the battle that he waged with himself. Is there anyone here this morning honest enough to admit, whether you're watching online or you're sitting in the service, that your private battles are much more intense than your public battles are? That the battles you face on the inside are a great deal harder than the battles that you face on the outside? Because at least my external battles, at least my outside battles, allow me to put up a defense. Help me, Holy Ghost. My external battles have a great deal of limitations due to the fact that I can cover myself in areas that I'm externally weak in and prevent their weapons from penetrating in those areas. But how do I protect myself from myself? How do I conceal my weakness from me? How can I win in the struggle that I have with myself? How can I battle loneliness? How how can I battle depression? How can I battle my complexes? How can I battle my proclivities? How can I pose my inclinations? How can I contest my idiosyncrasies and my psychosis when the person that is waging this war against me, when the person that's using my sensitivities against me is me? Am I talking to anyone? If I am, shout glory. Paul said, I've tried to be good all of my life. And even when I was doing wrong, I did it in the misguided opinion that it was not as bad as it really was. Not as wrong as it really was. Paul said, I tried to obey the law. I tried to obey the dictates of my conscience. I tried to be a good person to the best of my ability. But when I got saved, it awakened in me the realization that my priorities were misplaced. It awakened in me the realization that my right was wrong, my good was bad, and a change was necessary in my life. And so Paul said to himself, surely now, surely now that I'm saved, now that I've got the Holy Ghost, now that I'm a child of God, I'll have no problem 
problem getting and I'll have no problem keeping the victory over myself that is necessary for my development. But I find in myself a war. Is there anybody that's ever been in a war with yourself? Because even though I'm saved, the urges have not stopped. Even though I'm saved, the temptation has not subsided. Even though I'm saved, the inclinations that I'm attempting to resist, they're not only getting, they've gotten weaker, they're also getting stronger. It seems like it's worse now after I'm saved than it was before I was saved. Shout about it. Even though I'm saved, I'm still struggling with some stuff. Even though I'm saved, I still want to fornicate. Even though I'm saved, I still want to drink. Even though I'm saved, I still want to smoke. Even though I'm saved, I still have some stuff that I'm dealing with. Even though I'm saved, I'm still depressed. Even though I'm saved, I still feel suicidal. Even though I'm saved, oh, it gets bad out here sometimes. Even though I'm saved, I still struggle with myself. Shout glory right there. I still have urges. I still have thoughts. I still have feelings. I still have impulses. I still have desires that are not of God. I still have anger. I still have hate. I still have issues that I have not resolved. I still have a past that I haven't got the victory over. I still have some incidents that occurred in my life that are affecting the kind of person that I want to be right now. I still have things that happen to me that are controlling me at this very moment. Somebody shout glory. How many of you know that that's a sphere of Christianity that a lot of people don't want to talk about? And there's also a sphere of Christianity. In that sphere, there are a number of doctrines that have been advanced, promoted, espoused, and taught that were paraded as truth, but are in reality unscriptural fallacies. One that falls in that category is the doctrine of sinless perfection, or as you know, they call it entire sanctification. And the erroneous belief of entire sanctification or sinless perfection taught or teaches us that when you get saved, this is what some people say, when you get saved, you can advance to a position where you are beyond temptation. You're beyond tests. You're beyond trials. Somebody say the devil is a liar right there. How many of y'all know that that's anything but the truth right there? Peter said, don't think it's strange when you find yourself going through fiery temptations or fiery trials. He said, all that live godly shall suffer persecution. In other words, the devil is always going to attack you. The devil is always going to entice you. The devil is always going to try to allure you. Uh, see, 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 most Christians make the mistake of thinking that their greatest problems are from without. That if I can only get the victory over that thing over there, or that stuff back over there, or this right here, if I can only get the victory over that, I'll be all right. And yes, you will have opposition from the outside, but you have to understand that the greatest battle, the greatest problems are not from without. Your greatest problem is actually from within. <laughs> it's not the devil outside of you that's the problem. It's the devil that you let on the inside of you. That's the problem. And if you don't get the victory over that devil internally, you will never be able to walk in victory externally. Shout glory. Because your major problem is yourself. My major problem is me. It's not you. It's not that person on your job. It's not the relative. It's not the, the ex. It's not the next door neighbor. It's not your husband, not your wife. Your major problem is you. 
That's why he said, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's your flesh. It's your self. Selfishness. Self-will. Self-indulgement. Self-centeredness. It's your dependence upon yourself to walk this walk and to live this life and to accomplish your victory. Can I build a little bit more? Even though you are saved, you still have the sin nature on the inside. It's like, a, it's like a spark or an ember that's smoldering, that all it needs is a little air to be able to start raging out of control. John said, if we say we don't have it, we deceive ourselves. Oh, come on now. Now, that doesn't mean that we, like contrary to some people, that doesn't mean that we do sin every day. It means that no matter how saved you are, you can still sin any day. We still have, if not the proclivity to sin, we still have the potential to sin. So that even though the power of sin is broken in our lives, the potential for sin is still in effect because our sin nature is not eliminated at salvation. So there's a struggle, saints of God, between our sin nature, which we know of as our flesh, and the Holy Ghost resident in our human spirits. And this battle, this warfare is constantly being engaged. I remember when I was a little kid, they used to have the cartoons. And, and it would be, it would be the, the, the kid or whatever would be in the middle. And it would be an angel on one shoulder. And it would be a devil on another shoulder. You know, and he had the horns and the red suit, looked like he was on a hot sauce bottle. And, 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 and you would be in the middle. And the angel would be urging you to do right. And a devil on the other side would be poking you to do wrong. How many of y'all remember that? See, there's a battle that's constantly being waged. And this is what perplexes so many believers. Because I'm talking to you, same and to me. Because you love the Lord with all of your heart. You're not a hypocrite. You're not a phony. You're not a fake or a pretender. You love the Lord with all of your heart. And you're doing the best that you know to serve him. But at the same time, you still find yourself dealing with problems and dealing with issues that threaten to destroy everything you're seeking to accomplish in the Lord and for the Lord. If I'm talking to anybody, just let me know it. Power found himself as he called it in a straight betwixt because being Jewish now, he was the product of Jewish thought. Paul had a Jewish mindset that even though he wrote in Greek, he thought in Hebrew. Amen. And the Jews taught that there were three main things that would keep a person from giving in to their flesh. They believed that man was in possession of two natures, two tendencies. Man was in possession of two impulses, two sides. That man had a good side and man had a bad side, a good side and an evil side. And he taught that the good side yearned for God and the evil side constantly sought our destruction. And then they also then in conjunction with that, they believed that there were three main things that would keep you from giving in to the evil impulses that's in nature. And they thought that one was the law. One was our will, and the other was our mind. And Paul knew those precepts, and he knew that it was theoretically true. But he also knew that it was not experientially true. He said, I tried to keep the law, but I discovered that I could not keep it. He said, the will to do right is present within me, but how to perform that, I do not know. My will, he said, is not strong enough to resist this death devil that's alluring and enticing me and overcome sin because what I want to do I cannot consistently do and what I don't want to do I find myself consistently doing I find the law in my body warring against the law in my mind he said I see the law of desire opposing the law of my mind and putting me in a bondage that I can't find my way out of my desires lead me to do what my mind tells me what not to do my mind says don't do it my body says do 
it. My mind said don't drink it. My thirst said drink it. My mind said don't smoke it. My lungs said smoke it. My mind said don't do it. My body said do it. My spirit said don't do it. My flesh says do it. And I find myself in the middle being torn apart by the desires of my flesh and the law of the spirit of my mind. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so I try to occupy myself in the word of God in order to ensure my safety. I'm preaching somebody's story, but there still remains this struggle and all the realization of the reality of my situation accomplishes is to produce a demonstration of my inadequacy. Help me, Holy Ghost. It demonstrates the inadequacy of my human knowledge because if to know the right thing was to do the right thing, then life would be very easy. But knowledge by itself does not make a person good. I might know exactly how basketball is supposed to be played, but because I know how it's supposed to be played does not give me the ability to play it. We might know how we should behave in any given situation, but that's far from being able to behave the way I know I should behave. Knowing you should be, knowing you should do, does not empower you to be able to be or do. Y'all still with me? I'm gonna get you blessed, I promise. Morality is knowledge of what to do, but true spirituality is the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Morality is knowledge of a of conduct. Spirituality is knowledge of a person. And it's only when you know Jesus that you are able to do what you know you ought to do. So not only is the inadequacy of human knowledge demonstrated, the inadequacy of human resolution is as well. Because to resolve to do something is far from doing it. Because help me, Holy Ghost, resident in our human nature is a weakness of our will. Now my will comes up against the facts. My will comes up against the problem. My will comes up with diff difficulty. My will faces the opposition and my will fails. Peter said, help me Holy Ghost. Peter told Jesus, he said, I'll die with you before I deny you. But he caved in, help me Holy Ghost, when he was confronted. His spirit was indeed willing. But baby, his flesh was weak. My will is in my spirit. Oh, but my flesh, that's a whole other matter right there. Because a will without Jesus is a will with no strength. And lastly, the reality of my situation, can y'all help me please? It demonstrates the limitations of diagnosis. Because Paul knew what was wrong, but he was unable to make it right. He was like a doctor who could diagnose a disease, but could not prescribe a cure. He was like a person, oh help me Holy Ghost, that could tell you what's wrong but are incapable of fixing it. How many of you know I'm going to bless you right here that Jesus Christ is the only one who not only knows what's wrong but can also put the wrong to right. And he doesn't offer us criticism. He doesn't kick us when we're down. He reaches down and picks us up, cleans us off, and starts us back going again. Paul knew, help me Holy Ghost, that there remained in us a struggle with self. That's why he cried out from the depths of his spirit and the inner recesses of his soul. He said, oh wretched man, that I am. Is there anybody here that's ever cried that cry in the midnight hour when you're all by yourself? Oh wretched man, that I am. Lord, I'm a failure. Lord, I'm a loser. I'm tired of being defeated time after time again. Oh Lord, oh wretched man, no matter how hard I try, 
Christ. I seems like I can't get the victory. No matter how much I pray, I keep falling in the same area over and over and over again. No matter how much I read, no matter how much I study, no matter how much I attend church, the struggle does not subside. The struggle, it only gets worse. Oh, wretched man. Somebody say, oh, wretched man that I am. I'm wretched in my mind. I'm wretched in my emotions. I'm wretched in my desires. In my flesh dwells no good thing. I like the things that I'm supposed to hate. I hate the things that I'm supposed to like. I do the things I'm not supposed to do. I don't do the things that I am supposed to do. My life has become a living hell. I'm schizophrenic in my Christian identity. I'm torn between two loves split right down the middle. My spirit desires the right, but my flesh desires the wrong. And this battle, this struggle is killing me on the inside. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The little Greek says, who shall deliver me from this fatal body? My flesh is fatal to me. My flesh is killing me. My flesh is trying to destroy me. My flesh has become a poison to my existence. I've tried different solutions, but they didn't work. I tried to work it out on my own, and it only got worse. Tried to turn to people for help, but they only judge me. They only criticize me. They only condemn me. Am I talking to anybody? Who shall deliver me? Who shall deliver me in this struggle with myself? I'm my own worst enemy. I realize it now. I'm the reason for my failure. Who shall deliver me from myself? I know I need help, but I can't find it anywhere. Who shall deliver me? Who shall deliver me from myself? I know the right, but I keep doing the wrong. I know I should be further wrong than I am. I know I'm not as good as I ought to be, and it's killing me on the inside. I'm tired of giving in. I'm tired of giving out in the same area over and over again. I'm tired of apologizing. I'm tired of the turmoil. I'm tired of stumbling. I'm tired of falling. I'm tired of repenting. I'm tired of starting over. I'm tired of crying at night. Somebody say, who who shall deliver me? I don't like this life I'm living. I don't enjoy the duality of my existence. I feel like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a good person by day and a monster by night. And this warfare is affecting every level of my life because I maneuver so much between the two existence that I really don't even know. Which one is the real me? Am I a bad person that's trying to be good? Or am I a good person that keeps keep doing bad? There's an internal struggle that's almost driving me out of my mind. If I'm talking to you, if you've ever been there, somebody shout glory. How many of you will be honest to admit that you are there or you've been there at one time or another in your life? You're in a struggle with yourself. And if we could take your church face off, see your church face, that's the one you put on when you're getting out of your car in the parking lot. That's the one that walks in. Oh, praise everybody. Oh, I'm so good. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's your church face. Oh, hi, brother. Oh, hey, sister. Oh, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. That's your church face. But if we could take that church face off, help me, Holy Ghost, what we would see, maybe it would not be attractive. 
it would not be smiling, it would not be waving, it would not be congratulating, it would not be speaking, it would not be shouting hallelujah. If we could take your church face off, what we would see would not be very attractive. But I need to encourage somebody right now in the fact that no matter how hopeless your situation may seem, the battle isn't over until God says it's over. And God will not say it's over until you get the victory. Shout about it. I feel the Lord moving in this place. I need somebody to just start magnifying him. I need somebody that doesn't mind lifting him up. Because in the midst of this situation, Paul received a revelation. Because how many of you know that oftentimes the greatest revelations come out of the worst situations? The revelation of the fourth man came in the midst of a fiery furnace. Stephen's revelation came while he was in the process of being stoned. John's revelation came when he was in exile on the Isle of Patmos. Paul's revelation came from the depths of his because he had exhausted all his efforts and had reached rock bottom. But the blessing was in the fact that his condition forced him to trust and to cry out to the Lord, his God. Oh, who shall deliver me? That's what he cried. That was at the same time a cry of anguish and a cry of help. Because the minute he cried, who? He found his way to victory because he called upon a person for help but he didn't cry who in a generic sense as if he was unsure of who will reply the Greek text of that verse is masculine indicating that a specific person was the one being sought and that specific person was the Lord Jesus somebody shout hallelujah Paul here is not crying out from an exit from his physical body when he cried who shall deliver me he desired deliverance from his condition of defeat. He desired deliverance from his struggle with himself. And his cry for deliverance resulted in the revelation that he could do all things. Help me, Holy Ghost, through Christ who gave him the strength that he was more than a conqueror to him that loved him. Up to that time, Paul relied on his own ability. Up to that time, he was relying on his own mind, his own will to get the victory. But instead of victory, he only found defeat. See, some of you keep getting defeated because you're trying to get the victory on your own. You're trying to get the victory for yourself. Trying to get it on your own. And then here's the way, here's what messes you up. Uh, you, 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 you get spiritual about your efforts in the flesh. Uh, you think you're operating in the spirit, but you're really in the flesh. But it's the spiritual flesh, and that's what has you messed up. Because then you say to yourself, I've got to do something. I've got to do something to get the victory. And so I pray harder, and then that doesn't work. And I fast longer, and then that doesn't work. I start giving more. That doesn't work. I come lay at the altar, and that doesn't work. I I'm still defeated because I'm acting like I'm trusting in God, but in reality, I'm trusting in myself. I'm trusting in my ability to pray. I'm trusting in my ability to fast. I'm trusting in my ability to lay on the altar. I'm trusting in my ability to give. I'm trusting in my ability to do whatever is necessary. So I'm not trusting in God. I'm trusting in myself. And as good as as noble as those things are they can't get you the victory because your faith in that instance is actually based on works and that's what's so puzzling because they might be spiritual efforts but they're still works of the flesh talk to me somebody and works of the flesh can never bring deliverance can I go just a little bit further and then I'll bring you home I promise in the 25th verse Paul said I thank God 
out that my victory is coming through Jesus Christ, through Christ Jesus. I need somebody who's not ashamed to say my victory is coming through Christ Jesus. Come on, look at that person next to you and tell them, say my victory is coming through Christ Jesus. Paul was saying, I see a light at the end of this dark tunnel. I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. This is all going to work together for my good. After all, this poor man cried. This poor man cried. This poor man cried. And the Lord delivered me out of all my trouble. He said, because my victory is coming through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Somebody say, my victory is coming through Jesus Christ, my Lord. He is my help. He is my source. He is my refuge. He is my strength. He is my strong tower. He is my protector. He is my provider. He is my way maker. He is my need leader. He's my ball in Gilead. He's the lifter of my head. He's my way out of nowhere. He's the door opener. He's the rock of my salvation. He's my cup that runs over. Somebody shout, my victory is coming. My victory is coming. I will get the victory. I will win the battle. I will in the struggle. I will be all right. I will be okay. I will be victorious through Jesus Christ. Somebody say my victory is coming, it's coming, it's coming. That's why Paul could proclaim after the realization of the revelation that there is therefore now. Somebody say now. Somebody say there is therefore now. No. Somebody say now. No condemnation. No condemnation. I might have messed up, but there's no condemnation. I might have fallen short, but there's no condemnation. I might have used drugs, but there's no condemnation. I might have dipped into the world, but there's no condemnation. I might have fallen down, but there's no condemnation. Because even though I've fallen, look at somebody and say, even though I've fallen, I've gotten back up again. And there's no condemnation. Even though I went down, I didn't stay down. The fact that I'm here right now, the fact that I'm in attendance, the fact that I'm online proves the fact that there's no condemnation. And I no longer trust in myself to work all my issues out. I no longer trust in myself to walk in victory. I put all my trust in the Lord. And I don't walk anymore according to the dictates of my flesh. I now walk after the dictates of God's spirit. I let him do all the work. I let him work on me. I let him perfect me. I can't perfect myself. I can't improve myself. I've got to let him do it. And my, my reliance on him and his finished work on the cross brings into my life the power of the Spirit of God, which now enables me to choose the right, to choose the good, and refuse the wrong, refuse the bad, and enjoy victorious living instead of a defeated existence. And that's why I can now truly say, it's in him I live. I don't live in other people's opinions. I don't live in other people's judgment. I don't live in other people's observations. I don't live in other people's surmisings about how they think I should be or what they think I should do. All you got to do is this and why don't you stop doing that and why don't you... I don't do that. I don't, I, it's in him I live. And, and, and in him I'll move. And in him I have my being. And that releases me to say, and somebody needs to hear that this morning because this is the word that's going to set you free. Oh, God is leading me to tell you the struggle is over. Look at somebody and say, the struggle is over. The struggle is over. The struggle is over. Let me tell you something. God is never at a loss concerning 
his plan for our lives. Doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't get taken by surprise. He doesn't get caught off guard. The Bible says, known unto God are all his works. His works from the beginning of the world. And the Bible says, we are his workmanship. So known unto God are all his works. He's never at a loss regarding his plan for our life, regardless of what happens to us. God hates all sin, but God has made provision for the sinner through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. And I'm here to let somebody know this morning, whether you're in attendance or watching online, God will never quit on you. If you don't quit on him, God will never give up on you if you don't give up on him or if you don't quit or give up on yourself. See, the devil is a master. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren, accuses us 24-7. The devil is a master at getting us to focus on our failures. He's a master of getting us to focus on our wrongs, focus on our bad. And he wants us to be like Judas. The Bible says the devil entered into him, got in his mind afterwards. And he wants us to think our situation is hopeless. He wants us to think that it is impossible for us to be victorious over whatever it is that we're battling with, that it's no use. We we'll never get the victory. He wants us to get discouraged. And he wants us to give up and walk away from God. That's his, that's his overwhelming desire. That's why when the Lord told Peter, he says, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. That word desired in the Greek literally means demanded. With him being accuser of the brethren, he's a legalist. He, had, he said, because of this, I need to be able to attack him because he understood the deficiencies that were resident in Peter's character. He said, the devil has demanded to have you, that he could sift you as wheat. But notice what Jesus didn't say. He said, I pray for you. He didn't say, I'm praying that your courage hold out. He didn't say, I'm praying that your strength holds out. He didn't say, I'm praying that, that you'll be able to make. He said, I'm praying that your faith fails not. Because the devil wants you to get so discouraged that you give up and walk away from God. But look at somebody and say, but with God, all things are possible. Somebody give him a praise right there. Let, let, me, let, me, let me let you in on another secret, and I'm not in any way, form, or fashion trying to condone any of our indiscretions or wrongdoing, but the moment God saved you, God did so with complete knowledge of what you would do and what you would be in the future. And he did that in spite of all of our failures, in spite of all of our ups and downs, because God looks at us with the understanding of what he can make of us. Are you following me? He looks at us with the same faith that spoke the world into existence. And so he doesn't see us as we are now. He doesn't even see us as we are 10 years from now. God looks at us as a finished product. Yeah. Yeah. David was on the run, hiding in caves, faking like he was crazy, going into the, going into the camp of the Philistines, doing whatever he thought he had to do to alleviate whatever struggle he found himself in. And all the while God was saying, that's my king right there. That's my future king. He saw him as he would be. It does not yet appear what we shall be. Joseph was sitting in the prison, down in the deepest dungeon, falsely accused. God said, that's my prime minister right there. There's my prime minister. Moses was on a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an Arabian wilderness. 
a fugitive, a murderer. God said, that's my deliverer right there. He was out there 40 years. That's my deliverer. Year one, that's my deliverer. Year five, that's my deliverer. Year 25, that's my deliverer. He's cleaning up after sheep. He's, he's, he's tending another man's flock. That's my deliverer right there. Notice what happened when Paul got the revelation. He told Ananias, go lay hands on him and cause his sight to come back. He said, because he's a chosen vessel unto me. This is a guy that was wreaking havoc against the church, breathing out threatenings, trying to kill every Christian he could find. God said, he's a chosen vessel unto me to be what a light to the Gentile world. Say amen to me. That's why when we read Jude's statement, it has a meaning to it that is so glorious. Because this statement in Jude speaks of total victory. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And what Jude is not saying that God will keep you from ever stumbling. Well, he'll never keep you from making a mistake or keep you from falling short or struggling with desires or impulses that are not like him. What he was saying is, is that if we will totally look to the Holy Ghost, totally depend upon the grace of God, then he will keep us from falling away, from falling into apostasy, keep us from falling off, whereby we turn completely against God and walk away from the faith and walk away. And what he's saying is he will keep working in us and he will keep working on us until we have the victory. Because in this warfare that we are engaged in as believers, once again, it's the devil's desire to get us discouraged, to deny the faith, to say it ain't no use. This don't work. This Bible don't work. Turn completely away from God. But in all of our struggles, what does he say? He's able to keep you. No matter what you're struggling with, the Lord is saying, I will keep you. Help me, Holy Ghost. Until him who is able to keep you from falling, God said, I'll keep you from falling. I'll keep you from turning away. I'll keep you a Christian. I'll keep you from apostatizing. I'll keep you believing. I'll keep you trusting me in spite of all your struggling until your struggle is over. So I'm going to keep on sanctifying you. I'm going to keep you consecrated until the struggles you have with yourself are over. And then notice what Jude said. He will ultimately present you faultless before the presence of his glory. You know what this means? That we, we understand and recognize the fact that we will all have to stand before God one day. How many we see? We're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. If you say, you don't want to be the white throne. No, no, I don't want to be over there. We'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But the insinuation here is not that we're just going to be standing there the <laughs> like we, we stand out in front of Judge C. Christ looking around wondering what's about to happen that's not the insinuation Judah insinuates here that and you know we'll be, we'll, be in a, we'll be in a state of timelessness because we will be dwelling in eternity eternity etern, eternal means no time the word E in the Latin is no turn to E-R-N means time. We're being a state of time. So it's not like, you know, how long I got to be here? Hurry up and wait. It won't be that. But the insinuation is that when my turn comes, I will be presented before the Lord. That tell Scott and I get to walk. I will be presented. He said to present us faultless. That no matter what I've done, or no matter what I've struggled with in my life, when I stand before him, I, when I'm presented to him, I'll stand before him completely faultless, without a spot or a wrinkle or anything that defiles, because he's going to keep me until the struggle is over. Come on, stand up on your feet, clap your hands, open up your mouth, and give God all the praise. There's so much nonsense and foolishness out in the world that endeavors to overthrow our faith. And you know, I, I pretty much thought I heard just about everything. I heard something the other day that just kind of like tripped me out. 
My wife and I were watching one of those secular documentaries. You, you guys ever watch the secular documentaries? And it started out as a documentary about the Catholic Church. You know, it just happened to be on and we didn't turn the channel. And it was talking about how they, they, the, the Jesuits believed that Jesus is going to come to earth in the alien spaceship and all of this stuff. And that was one thing. But then it went into a study of the Old Testament. And they were endeavoring to debunk the Bible. So that's what got my attention. And they said something I've never heard before in my life. I shouldn't even tell y'all it's that stupid, but it was, it, it was, it was funny. Because I kept saying it, and my wife kept, kept telling me, shut up. They said that when Moses was on the backside of the desert, right, and the bush was burning, that it was possibly an acacia bush. And that the acacia bush, the smoke, has a hallucinogenic effect. In other words, Moses sat back, started smelling the smoke, and got high. And thought he heard God calling him out the bush. <laughs> I ain't never heard that like that before. <laughs> Moses said he heard the bird, bird, voice of God. No, he was just high, man. That's all. He, was, he got high off the acacia smoke. <laughs> but do you know there are people that hear that stuff and believe it? Because in those documentaries, they talk with a matter-of-fact tone and act as if they're presenting the truth. But somebody say, the devil is a liar. <laughs> Lift your hands. Father, in the outstanding, tremendous, magnificent, spectacular name of Jesus, whose we are and whom we serve, we thank you for allowing us, amen, this divine access into your presence. We thank you for the light, the illumination, the enlightenment, the revelation that accompanies the reception of your word. Now I pray for each and every one of these blessed believers under the sound of my voice in attendance and online. I pray that even as they are struggling with themselves in areas that they desire to remain private, impulses, urges, desires, habits, proclivities, inclinations, the flesh that they're struggling with, that they are endeavoring to crucify on a daily basis. I pray that you infuse them with the power of the Holy Ghost that you give them the ability and the stability to resist the, in the devil's devices, amen. I pray that you empower and enable them to overcome in the areas that they are struggling in. And I pray that you give them the divine assurance that there's no condemnation to them that are walking in the spirit, in union with your spirit. Lead them, guide them, direct them. Besides still waters. Amen. Give them a tranquility and a peace that passes all understanding. That this warfare that they are engaged in on a daily basis. Amen. That this sickness is not unto death. That this battle is not unto defeat. That they can do all things through the power that you have given them. Through the relationship that they have with you. Give them the confidence. Amen. To stand in the face of the attack and to withstand, having done all to stand. I pray, O oh Lord, that you give them the intestinal fortitude to resist the enemy so that he may flee from their life. Now, Lord, we thank you in advance for that which you are doing, that which you have done, that which you are yet to do in their life. I thank you that you see us as finished works. I thank you that the performance of your goodwill shall be accomplished in us that the good work you have begun, you'll be faithful to perform. I pray that you bless them with the desires of their heart as a result of the delight that they have in you, that you open for them doors no man could close. I pray that you bless them exceeding and abundantly above all that they can ask or think according to your power and work on their behalf. Now we give you glory, honor, and praise in advance for everything we're expecting you to do. We call it done. and We walk in it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen one more time. Say it one more time. Somebody say the struggle. Say my struggle. Somebody say it's over. And it's over right now. Clap your hands, open up your mouth one more time. Take yourself a minute and just give God. Give him a round of praise. Lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. Open up your mouth. Let praises proceed forth from your lips. 
Lord, I thank you for victory. I thank you. I thank you, oh Lord. In Jesus' name. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. You're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. Nobody promised us it would be easy. But we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. You're struggling, but you're going to be all right. Got some things going on in your life that you wish were not there, but you're going to be all right. Got some things that you've done that you wish you hadn't done, but you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. The Lord told me to tell you, you're going to be all right. We all struggle with ourselves, struggle with thoughts, feelings, urges, inclinations, struggle with our tongues, struggle with our attitude, struggle with feelings of inferiority, insufficiency, inadequacy. So many things that we don't like about us. We don't like the way we look. We don't like how much we weigh. We don't like the size we are. We don't like uh, the things that we allow to bother us. So many things we don't like about ourselves. And then we try to correct the externals. And then we find out we still have these internal feelings. But God said, cast all your cares on me. And see, here's the thing you can't do. You can't give it to God and hold on to it at the same time. When you give it to God, you've got to let it go. you got to release it over. The battle is not mine, it's his. The struggle, what does he tell Jacob? He said, let me go. Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until he lets you bless me. Then afterwards, Jacob testified. He called the name of that place Peniel. He said, I've seen God face to face. I've had an encounter with God, and my life has been preserved. But in the literal Hebrew, he said, I've seen God face to face, and my life is healed. I've seen God face to face, and I'm fixed now. I'm fixed now. My life is better now. I'm all right now. All this time I was struggling, I'm running away from my home, I defrauded my brother, and but I realized my struggle wasn't with my family, wasn't with my father, wasn't with my struggle was with myself. He said, but once I had this encounter with God, I'm all right now. And you know how everybody knew he was all right? Because he didn't walk like he used to walk. He said, this limp that I have is a sign that I'm all right now. <laughs> oh, look at Jacob. That's Jacob. He don't walk like he used to walk. That's Harry, that's Joe, that's Dick, that's Bobby, that's Daryl, that's Mike, that's Terry. They don't walk like they used to walk. They don't roll like they used to roll. They don't do like they used to do. They don't live like they used to live. That's the sign that I'm all right now. God told me to tell you, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. Amen? Amen? Clap your hands one more time. I went a little longer than I usually desire to go. Listen, we're going to bless the Lord right now in a different way through the giving of our material gifts. We're going to pay our tithe right now. And we're going to give the Lord our very, very, very best offering on today. The tithe is the tenth. It is holy unto the Lord. My tithe. Actually, the Bible says in the seventh chapter of the book of Hebrews, he says, here men that die, people, human, ordinary people, pay our tithe. But there God receives it of whom it is witnessed that he lives. In other words, when we pay our tithe here, my tithe is saying that I believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So my tithe has significance. My tithe, my tithe testifies to the fact that I no longer live the way I used to live. I no longer walk the way I used to walk. I no longer do the things that I, I don't, my, my money doesn't go exclusively towards the things that it used to go with. Because the Bible says my money, my treasure, and my heart you know where my heart is? Look where my money goes. You want to know where somebody's heart is? Just look at their checkbook. Look at their bank statement. That tell you where their heart is. What you, what you devote your money to is where your heart is at. I knew, where my, I knew where my heart was when I wasn't saved. It wasn't hard to track where my money went to. And come on, say amen to me. Whenever you got some money, you start planning in advance what you was going to do with it. 
Some of us, when we weren't saved, we couldn't wait till Friday because you got paid. And you knew on Tuesday you was going to cut a fool on Friday night. <laughs> you knew what you was going to do. I can't wait to get paid. <laughs> I'm going to the crap game. I can't wait till I get paid. <laughs> I'm going to the club. I can't wait till I get paid. I'm going to the dope house. I can't wait till I get paid. I'm going to the bar. I can't wait till I get paid. I'm going to the mall. I can't wait till I get paid. Y'all knew what y'all was going to do. Get saved. I can't wait till I get paid. I'm going to church. I can't wait till I get paid. I'm paying my tithes. I can't wait till I get paid. I'm giving an offering. I can't wait till I get paid. My, the Lord is going to get his cut. Say amen. amen. So we want to bless him. Let's pay our tithe. Give the Lord our very, very, very best offering. Amen. Today is the first Sunday of the month. Every first Sunday, we as a body of believers have committed, we covenanted to sow a, 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 a first of the month building fund seed once a month. What, how much is it? $33? $33, right? Right, about a dollar a day. A dollar a day to commit towards the upkeep and the facilitation of this great building. We have an ambitious building program that we're, going, we're beginning to undergo even now. We want to replace the carpet, try to have it replaced before Easter, um, but it's going to depend on y'all. And there's some other things we're, we're endeavoring to do. A lot of things that you can't see. We're trying to get new air conditioning units for the grand ballroom, and we're trying to do a number of things that's going to take, I mean, our, our agreement, our unity, our cooperation to be able to get it done. Amen? So it's imperative that you be faithful and obedient in the giving. If you're faithful in the little, God will make you ruler over the much. Amen. So I want you to sow that $33 building fund seed today. Those of you that are watching online, go to giveify.com or text to give or PayPal or whatever platform you utilize. Amen. To sow seed into the kingdom of God through New Spirit Revival Center. I want you to go there and do that. Amen. And those of you in attendance, I want you to play, pay your tithe, give the Lord your best offering, and sow into the building fund. The Lord has need of it. Amen? I pray I blessed you today. Was anybody blessed? I pray at least one person was able to receive what I was saying. If just one person got it, it was worth preaching to everybody. Amen? I commend you guys on your church attendance on the day. Amen? And uh, God is going to bless you. I promise you. The struggle is over. You're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. Let go. What they used to tell us, let go and let God. Lord, this is your battle. Lord, you do it. Lord, you clean me up. Lord, you make it happen. He'll make it happen. I promise. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. When everyone is standing, ushers lead from the rear. Everybody walking so nobody has to squeeze past you, step on your toe, get you all out the spirit. Amen. Everybody walking. Everybody coming.
thank God for the word that went forth. Oh, we can do better than that. That was, oh, come on, come on. Let's thank God for that word that went forth. I was, I was standing up here. The, the offering, let's stretch our hands toward the offering. Lord, we thank you for the tithes and offering. They are blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dr. D said, um, just let everybody know that the uh, fast is over at midnight tonight. And then he said, or should we let them go that the fast is over now? I said, now. <laughs> Forget now. <laughs> Come on. Let's thank God. A lot of breakthroughs that took place this last month. We were able to refocus. We were able to see things from a different point of view. Let's thank God for pastors who, who even when we don't know what to do, they know how to shift us and get us to a different place a different place in our walk, a different place in our prayer life, a different place in the way that we view things. Come on and give God some praise. So the fast is over. I know, I know, I know, I already know. I already know it's all good, it's all good. We are gonna open up the, the um, altar um, on today if you stand in need of prayer. But before we even go any further, those of you who are here who have heard the word and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day you don't want to leave here the same way that you came. If there's any question that if something was to happen to you when you left here, whether or not you would go to heaven, that, that's a clue that you need to make your way to the altar. Come on, somebody. Amen. So everyone, everyone is saved. Everyone knows. Everyone is in a relationship with the Lord. And there's some that's been visiting, and you're, you've been saying you're going to join. But today is the day. This is, this is a, a good day to join New Spirit Revival Center. So everyone is OK. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come right now, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you for the word that went forth, Father. We thank you for Dr. Darrell, Lord. We pray right now, Father, that you would just pour back into him everything that he poured out. Lord, I thank you for that word, that even in the midst of our struggle, Lord, you're still with us, that, that it's, the battle is not over until we get the victory, Lord, and we hold on to that. So, Lord, we thank you for the word that went forth. We thank you, Lord, even for this upcoming week, the services, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the vision and everything that's taken place in New Spirit. Lord, we thank you for our pastors. So, Lord, we ask right now that you would just continue to have your way this week. And we're going to give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. The altars are open for additional prayer. God bless you. Well, fam, isn't that a word straight from heaven? Oh my goodness. Now you take that word and take it with you all through the week to be fuel for your spirit, to strengthen you and keep you. Listen, if you haven't had a chance to give yet, the options for giving are right on the screen. The Bible says the liberal soul shall be made fat. And when your seed leaves your hand, it does not leave your life. And remember, there's a harvest attached to every single seed you sow. So let's always give always in full expectation, knowing and believing and trusting that for every seed we sow, there is a harvest on the way. Please join us for worship services this coming Sunday at 1015 a.m. in person and 11 o'clock a.m. online. And then be sure to join us on Tuesdays online or in person at 730 for prophetic power prayer. And please don't forget to join us for our midweek Bible study service at 7.30 on Thursday evenings online. At New Spirit Revival Center, you can be sure to get a few things. Sound doctrine, for sure. A word from the Lord, for sure. A sure word, a seasoned word, for sure. And a word that will change your life. Holy Spirit filled services. Holy Ghost led love from the uh from our members and just everything you could want in a church church the way it's supposed to be so come on and join us 
Have a blessed week. We love you. See you on Tuesday.